do you think knows more about the human body, modern fitness experts today, or the physical culturists of the 1800s? The average person would tell you, by an overwhelming percentage, that modern authorities know more and have for quite some time, which seems to stem from the general view that everything in society always progresses and evolves, rather than devolves over time. However, with regard to physical fitness, popular methods seem to have gotten worse, not better, and you may be surprised to learn that many of the popular modern exercises you do are damaging your body in the long term. And although this would have been an extremely controversial opinion had I made this video a mere 10 years ago, the fact is that modern studies are coming out today which have indicated. To explain, my long journey into studying the physical fitness methods of the past recently led me to attempt a new series of posture exercises, which originate from the 19th century, with very positive personal results. At the same time, by sheer coincidence, I also began looking into new scientific findings related to physical therapy, among them being a number of so-called discoveries that many of the popular exercises that we grew up with are actually harmful to the human body. And when I read that, I had to laugh because it was clear that the physical culturists of the 19th century had avoided those problems. In other words, the folks back then knew better. To start with a well-known example, let's take the sit-up, one of the most popular, basic, modern exercises, which almost everyone has done at some point in their life, whether in school, at the gym, in the military, etc. According to a recent article by Harvard Health Publishing, sit-ups are now considered harmful in the long run because it involves curving your spine and grinding it against the floor. With a typical modern sit-up, the curling movement of the body works against the natural curvature of the spine, and can lead to lower back discomfort, pain, and even injury. Modern sit-ups also place strain and stress on the neck as it collapses forward throughout the movement. A 2005 study actually found that 56% of soldiers' injuries relating to the quote, old fitness test administered by the army were directly due to sit-ups, and the authors of the study admitted that it was only taking acute injuries into account, not even long-term damage, which was also possible. For that reason, by 2015, the Navy Times called for sit-ups to be banned completely. The U.S. Army began to phase out sit-ups for some soldiers, and the Navy and Marine Corps also considered new fitness requirements. For similar reasons, straining to touch your toes with your feet together is no longer considered a healthy stretch by physical therapists, and like sit-ups, can cause lower back pain. See how flexible you are? Don't do that yeah, one. Yeah, right? absolutely terrible on your back. It stresses that low back and the discs in the low back. Multiple studies on, on this have shown this. Astonishingly, through either experience or the accumulated wisdom of the ages, the 19th century physical culturists knew all of these things already, especially the Swedish and German ones, who were among the most influential of their time. So, for instance, in 19th century Swedish calisthenics, most of the folding of the body occurs at the hips rather than in the lower back. In fact, they illustrated the modern position of touching the toes as a, quote, faulty position, that is, as what not to do. Instead of trying to touch the toes as some sort of arbitrary goal or benchmark, the Swedes kept the legs and torso straight and folded the body as much as possible while using the pelvis rather than the lower back as the hinge. This same principle is followed in other Swedish exercises, such as the forward trunk flexion while in the lunge that you see here. Ironically, Per Henrik Ling, the famous creator of this method, was attacked, at the time, by his rivals for not knowing anything about the human body, and for basing his method on so-called false principles. But apparently, he knew more than fitness gurus of the 20th and 21st centuries. If you look at the German school of gymnastics within the Turner Physical Culture Movement, you will see similar principles with regard to the positions used in calisthenics, dumbbells, wands, and Indian clubs, keeping a straight back while using the hips rather than the lower part of the spine as the hinge of the movement. Although the Germans did show a bent back in some hanging positions, these were done briefly for relaxation without stress or strain. Also, although the Germans did touch the toes in some positions, such as in the so-called windmill that you see here, this was done with only one hand and with a wider stance, which removed much of the stress that exists in the modern toe-touching position. 
Another problematic modern exercise is the common one of placing a barbell on the back of your neck, which collapses your neck forward, as in the modern sit-up. This is another harmful practice that is now starting to be noticed by physical therapists. Both the shoulder, your head goes forward, it's a double whammy. Uh, that one is really a big no-no. However, when the Germans used wands or barbells in the 1800s, they would brace them against the back of their shoulders, rather than the neck itself. So they knew better and were ahead of their time on this issue. So why the big difference between then and now? Well, physical culturists of the 19th century had different objectives than we do today. They generally weren't trying to produce Olympic athletes, sports champions, bodybuilders, nor was the average person trying to emulate them. Instead, it was holistically focused with an emphasis on maintaining longevity. As one text of the period explained, quote, another very important purpose of exercise is to keep the body young. So now I'm going to show you some of the 19th century posture exercises that I've been doing, which I mentioned earlier. So helpful are these exercises that they have now replaced all but one of the posture exercises that I was previously doing and that I showed in my earlier videos on posture. The following ones come from Jesse Hubble Bancroft, one of the great authorities on posture during that era and who authored a number of exercise texts. In her treatise, Bancroft states that she is not inventing anything new, but is merely recompiling and applying pre-existing principles, namely from the Swedish method and the German school. As these exercises utilize muscles which are little used and atrophied in most people today, they should initially be done in only two or three repetitions. Otherwise, injury may occur. In this first exercise, you swing your elbows forward, resting the knuckles of the fingertips gently on your shoulders. Then, you raise your elbows back in a wide circular motion, keeping your shoulder blades as close as possible throughout the movement. As they lower, the elbows should come to stop when they cannot continue the movement without the shoulder blades coming apart. Then, the elbows are swung forward into the original relaxed position. This exercise strongly works the rhomboid muscles of the back, which prevent the shoulders from drooping forward, as in bad posture. In the next exercise, the initial position is a completely relaxed neck with the head tilted backward. After a moment, the head is tilted forward and the chin strongly downward to create a double chin. This strengthens the back of the neck and is designed to prevent a drooping or tortoise-like head posture. Next is the first of several torso exercises. The heels are together, toes out at 45 degrees. The lower and upper back remain completely straight, as do the legs. The hinge of the movement is completely from the hips. As you lean forward, keeping the head and torso completely straight, your rear end sticks out slightly to counterbalance the forward lean. When your hamstrings begin to burn and you cannot lean any more with a straight back, you've gone as far as you should go. You must not compromise your posture. The average person, including myself, will not be able to lower their torso to even 90 degrees in this exercise. However, my wife Bronwyn is more flexible. Here she demonstrates what an advanced person can do with a more advanced hand position, according to Bancroft. And here is an even more advanced version, according to the Swedish method, from the early 1800s. This version uses extended arms, perfectly in line with the body, which places extra leverage and stress on the lower back muscles. It should not be attempted by the beginner. In this next trunk exercise, you bend the hips in a sideward direction, keeping the torso straight and with both feet continually glued to the ground. The next exercise is the healthy 19th century version of the sit-up. 
The feet should be braced under furniture or a heavy object. The legs can be either straight or bent. The torso begins in an erect position in accordance with the aforementioned principles. The back, head, and neck are kept straight throughout the entire exercise, and the hips, rather than the lower back, is the hinge for all movement. The torso slowly lowers as far as it can go without the abdominal muscles quivering or shaking. If they do, that means you have gone too far. Then you slowly rise to the original position. The focus here is on form and posture, not on straining or maxing out the ab muscles. In fact, if done correctly, you will probably feel greater fatigue in your hips and lower back than in your abdominal muscles. Together, all these muscles help maintain good posture. The last exercise is basically a Swedish knee bend and was commonly used by the German turners as well. With your feet turned out at 45 degrees and maintaining a straight posture, you rise up on your toes, then bend the knees and slowly descend, heels touching. The key thing here is to keep your neck and torso straight the entire time, always perpendicular to the ground without any leaning forward. This exercise helps with both posture and balance. Uh, so that completes this uh, sequence of exercise that she says to do. She does have uh, other things you can do to intensify these exercises by basically uh, raising the arms into higher positions above your head. That'll all put a lot more leverage uh, and intensity on your trunk muscles, but uh, I would not start off by doing it like that. And of course, you can also uh, up the reps eventually. Hope it helps. If you'd like to know more about these exercises in even greater depth and how they are done, please consider supporting us on Patreon, a link to which can be found in the video description below. Thanks for watching and have a great day.